Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast. We are the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Pawtucket, and all stops in between. Thank you for the download. My name is Chris Hatfield. I am the executive editor of SoxProspects.com, and I am joined, as always, by our director of scouting, Ian Cundell. Ian, what's going on, buddy? How you doing, Chris? It's... uh. It's been a while. It's good it's to be been back, a minute. Talking, yes. back on the horn, talking shop. Yes, yes. Um, some housekeeping, everyone. First of all, um, I'm going to be tweaking the intro on the podcast to make it a bit shorter. So if you're a longtime listener and you, like me, sometimes fast forward through the intro parts of podcasts, give it a couple episodes, let me settle in. I think it's going to be a little bit shorter. Um, so we're, we're always trying to make the show better, and we're going to start doing that. Um, second housekeeping thing. We promised you a spring training scouting podcast. We report, we recorded it. It exists. It's basically been a comedy of errors trying to get that thing out um, for production, logistical reasons. Um, but we're going to get it out. We, we thought about sitting on it. And I think, Ian, um, you know, basically based on the fact that the content in there is still useful, we will sound a little funny talking about things like Jay Groom not knowing he's about to undergo Tommy John surgery yet at the time we're recording the podcast, but it's got great info. And I, I think Ian, we don't want to just sit on it. We want to release that. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, there's some interesting guys that we talked about. And mm-hmm. as you said, a lot of it is still pretty relevant. Um, and it'll given be yeah. what's going on with the system right now. So I think uh, you guys will enjoy it. Yeah. And it's, it'll be an interesting exercise really i think it, releasing it when we are like months later and it's it's kind of good because we can hold our feet to the fire man like yeah, if we we're in you. there talking about i mean i think about you know we're talking about guys like i, I think did we did we talk about cole brannon yeah we did and, and we, we were and now he's bought on with that one yeah and now he's been demoted to lowell so um yeah so it, it'll be interesting um to see how that holds up I, I remember one another person we talked about where the the Stanley Esp- or not Stanley Espinal the uh, Curve and Suarez um, Ever Luis Lozada mm-hmm. pairing and at the time uh, they were both performing pretty well but yeah, over the yeah. last like month they've come back to earth pretty hard which yeah. I guess was kind of expected but was not something uh, we talked about at the time right. given they were excelling right. you know young guys in Greenville right right um, so yeah so that's coming bear with us we're going to push this one out first because the draft is coming up we're going to talk about the draft the draft starts Monday the 4th let's go draft season yes um, I did not realize it was on the 4th this year I think is it, it's, it's know, earlier it's weird. than last year it starts, um, it starts Monday yeah so we're um, that snuck up on us a little bit we're going to push this episode out because it will be completely untimely if there's a draft pick and we're not talking. We're talking like there's no draft pick yet. Um, so that's coming, <laughs> especially given the state of the system right now. Right, which we'll get to. Um, so there's that teaser. Bear with they us. They call it teaser. Uh, third bit of housekeeping, uh, and then we'll get into the a very short normal intro, and and we'll go. Um, it's the Sox Prospects Donation Drive. Everyone, we, we we tell you every episode about how you can support the podcast uh, with a per episode pledge on Patreon.com. But this is the one time a year where we really ask you to chip in if you're so inclined to help support the website. Donations go to cover things like the spring training trip, so that we can see all these guys and do things like record a scouting podcast and release it like three months after we were in spring training. But um, no, seriously, joking aside, it's where we can see a lot of guys. Also helps cover, like you know, kind of operating costs. Um, it's it's really important to us. We, I think we set a goal of 8K, Ian. Um, That's correct. Yes, yeah, so we're setting a goal of $8,000. Um, so you can help to contribute. Head to SoxProspects.com slash donate.htm. Don't forget the .htm. Again, that's SoxProspects.com slash donate.htm. And when in doubt, just go. It's the top post on the news page right now. So um, make sure you just head there. Again, we really appreciate everybody's support uh, in the past, and again, we could use your support again this year. Uh, and of course, as always, shout out to our five dollar level Patreon supporters: that's Sock Signatures, Lendell Martin, Kirby Miller, Gerardo Ian Tosca, Kyle Costigan, Tyler Woodrow, Jeff Trainer, David Nardone, Tim Harding, Hurricanes One, Bill Stanton, Deb Kendall, and Evan Kirkwood. Huh. Uh, finally, send your emails to podcast at socksprospects.com. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. Ian, let's jump into it without any further ado. It's been over a month since we've talked. We have 
new rankings twice over, <laughs> uh, and, and a lot has happened. But uh, let, let's start here, Ian, um, because we've kind of tiptoed around it for the past couple of months. Um, but I think once we posted these new rankings, which kind of the headliner, which we'll talk about, is Jay Groom is no longer the top prospect because he needs Tommy John surgery. Um, the rankings yeah. look a lot different. The fact of the matter is, f- looking exclusively at the farm system, things are bad. <laughs> things, no, are not, not, things are not, not good. Great. It's not great. Um, it's They've kind of been hit by the combination of the perfect storm, I would say. Yeah. And in the sense that they've had guys, they've lost their top guys through injury or suspension after trading most of their other top guys or calling up those other guys. And then you combine that with the performances for the most part have been well below average from what you'd expect from guys who have talent. They just haven't been able to translate that onto on-field production this year. And it's all of that combined into one little like big, you know, big casserole of not great systemness. And that's what we have right now. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. I, I would have to say, I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest, even though we rank 60 deep, the most important part of the farm system is the guy, the guys who you would rank at the top of a ranking list. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I have not been this underwhelmed by the top of our rankings since probably 2012. Um, and I, have and, to go, I gotta go look back at the X rankings. So this, the, the top of the, let's, let's put it this way. The April 5th, 2012 ranking was led by Will Middlebrooks. Um, the number two prospect was Anthony Renato, although at the time you and I did not agree with that. Correct. Um, the number three prospect was Xander Bogarts. Before he was uber prospect Xander Bogarts, he was just really interesting prospect Xander Bogarts. He was just 260 hitter in Greenville Xander Bogarts. Right, who, who showed a lot of pop. Um, yeah. But then it was Jose Iglesias. It actually doesn't look bad in hindsight. No, in hindsight, it's not bad because you have like Blake Swihart down at 10. Yeah, Blake Swihart's at 10. I mean, it's basically the 2011 draftees hadn't had a chance to percolate up yet. Yeah. Um, and actually, th- that's ca- that's kind of the point I want to get to. The the part the point at which the system started being very weak was the, the, basically all of 2011. It was not great. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. 2011 is not. 2011 was not great. The start of April 2011, the number one prospect was Ryan Kalish. The number two prospect was Jose Iglesias. The number three prospect was Anthony Renato. The number four prospect was Drake Britton. Um, just to put this all in context, yeah, Michael Navarro who we projected to be a utility player was the number eight prospect. Um, And that was Lars Anderson. Lars Anderson years in Portland or post type post type. Lars Anderson was still the number nine prospect. Yeah. Um, It wasn't great. Colburn Vidic was number 10. Um, Yeah. It was just, it was not good. Things were bad. Um, Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, Shea Swan Lynn at 17, Kyle Weiland at 18. Juan Carlos Linares was the number 19 prospect. <laughs> oh, he's the guy who looked like uh, one of the bad guys from DuckTales. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. Uh, trust me. <laughs> I'll, I'm going to send you a picture right now. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll take a pause so that Joe can write that down uh, as the, the podcast episode name. <laughs> he looked like one of the bad guys from DuckTales. Where, I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna send you the link in Skype chat. Ready? I, uh, you're, you're gonna agree with me. Okay. All right. All right. That's the picture of the DuckTales guys. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Juan Carlos Linares. <laughs> oh my god, he so does the one on the right. Yeah, and then here's the picture of Linares. Oh my god. What's the Google search you use to find that image? I just use DuckTales bad guys. And then look at that. Tell so, me there isn't a spitting resemblance there. All right. So if you Google DuckTales, that's T-A-L-E-S, right? Yeah, one, one Bad word. guys. And you do the Google image search, it's the first image. And there's, yeah, and then, three, there's three guys. With, and then here's another one. I mean, I've got the Google image search up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. He Tell looks me. like the guy on the right you see, in the you first can see one. It, right? Yes. Yeah, you see it, right? Okay, yeah. thank you. That's why I Sorry, lost that. my mind. 
when that's, I was laughing. That's, I, that's everything I remember about Juan Carlos Linares. Was, I just remember at the time thinking that, and it stuck with me oh, now, so seven years later. <laughs> by, uh, by the way, I have to say DuckTales, all-time great NES game. Oh, uh, it's a fantastic TV show, too. Yes, yes. You can All probably right. guess my age based on that. <laughs> I thought DuckTales would be before your time, actually. No, it was in like the... Uh, Oh, I guess it was the no. It was a reboot of the '80s, so it wasn't the original original. Because okay, oh no, yeah. it was in the '80s. Yeah, yeah. No, That's I what watched I was saying. that was like because it was, was like, on Nintendo. I mean, did you ever have a regular Nintendo? Yeah, no. Actually, I'm just looking at. I didn't realize it was from '87 to '90, and so I watched it on like VHS when I was probably like six, seven, like that age. So, but it was done Which was like, when? when I was a baby still. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Cause I, yeah. I watched it when I, okay, we're getting <laughs> way out there. Let's <laughs> reel it back in. System's bad. Last <laughs> time it was this bad was 2011, but what happened in 2011? Okay. Was the Red Sox had potentially the best draft ever full stop. Are you saying for them or anyone? It might be for anyone. Certainly for them. Yeah, it's a pretty good draft. It's a really good draft. But Especially you can, if, you, if you consider production not on the Red Sox. Yeah, I mean, because if you look at the 2011 draft, obviously the headliner is Mookie Betts in the fifth round. Okay, in the first round, they got Matt Barnes, who's basically gr- turning into a setup guy. Jackie Bradley, who's a major league regular in center field. Blake Swihart, we'll talk about in a bit. Henry Owens flamed out. But you've still got Noe Ramirez, who's now like a really good middle reliever on the angels. You've got Travis Shaw who He's signed middle of who's the bat. a middle of the order bat. I mean, just those guys alone. I mean, they drafted and didn't sign Mac Williamson. So he doesn't really count, but Gossett too is a big leaguer. Yeah. Danny, they right. Didn't they didn't sign him, but I mean, Sequiz Galson is a pretty good cornerback. No, um, he's got cut though. He's oh, did he? hurt. That's too bad. It, yeah, and, and I would say, like, the other two guys still in the system, Weems and Jarrett Jerez, I've seen both of them recently. I would give them both greater than 50% chances of pitching the big leagues at some point. Yeah, so, I mean, if you if you make your first four, five, six, seven, eight picks and all of them play in the big leagues and your ninth rounder is a major league regular, at least under the old system, under the new system, Shaw wouldn't have gone in the ninth. But No. You, they have a chance for their point. top 10 rounds to either be in jail or be in the big leagues. <laughs> well, or except, the for, NFL. except for go, uh, so yeah, right. or the NFL. That's pretty well, impressive. Well, Pena, Pena never went to jail. He just got suspended oh, three times. Yeah, sorry. I should. Yeah, allegedly. For the other guys, too. I don't know. If, I'm just, I think he's no, Cook, and, Cook, Cook went to jail and Kobach got arrested. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I wasn't. I, didn't, I just realized that it's probably not a great thing to just throw that around loosely. No, yes, I mean, that's they, public they were, knowledge. They, they, they were either legal issues, NFL, or major league players. So. Right. 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 Yeah, so that's a really good draft. Jesus. God, Mookie Betts is so good too. <laughs> right. But that's what I'm saying. So that's that was the year their system was at the weakest. Now, of course, it was helped by the fact they had four first round picks. Yeah, which it was helped happen. by the fact that it was before the cap went into place. I understand. It's funny that. though that even then they only spent ten million. It wasn't like they spent like thirty million on that. Like to right. get that ROI from ten million is insane. But did they only spend ten million? Yeah, ten nine or ten eight something. Or ten, maybe nine. ten oh nine. Yeah, so just yeah. under eleven. The ROI on that is well, it's just under eleven, and if they had to do that because they had four first round picks. Yeah. So after that, yeah, I mean, Mookie Betts was seventy hundred fifty k. Travis but Shaw I, got one hundred and ten k. But I think that that just shows the value of a good draft can add to an organization, how right. quickly things can turn around. So things can turn around that way. Also, 2011 was the year that Xander Bogarts went to Greenville and hit, like, however many he hit what, what it, in, like, two-thirds of a season, hit 16 home runs as an yeah. 18-year-old in Greenville. I mean, you know, Which it was that breakout year. So, like, these things are cyclical. That was the year, they, that was the year they signed Margo, too. Okay, yeah, so there you go. So th- these things are cyclical is the point I'm trying to make. Just because the system is not good right now does not mean that it will always be bad. Okay, yeah. there's that. There's also the fact that, you know, guys could be in the system right now who come out of nowhere. Um, you know, when you think about the fact that Mookie Betts was entering the 2012 season not a ranked prospect. No, I think he was ranked. He was in like he was like fifty two or something though. Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay, you're right. He was in the top sixty. He was. He was in the, the top sixty. End. He was in the back end of the top sixty. Good point. Point taken. But point stands. 
Yes. For all we know, I don't know, Tyler Esplin becomes like some middle of the order bat or, you know, higher up in the rankings, Danny Diaz turns out to be a stud. He's the next Rafi Devers. Um, you know, some other guy that they signed for 10 K becomes the next, you know, Felix Dubrant or Stolmy Pimentel or whatever, you know, who knows? So point being, there's still reasons to be optimistic. There's still reasons to at least keep an eye on things. You never know who's going to break out. Um, so there's reason to have faith in it. Have I done a good job of expressing the glass half full perspective? Yeah, no, and, and, and as, as you kind of said, profit development isn't a linear thing. And if it was, you know, it would be easy to predict what's going to happen. I mean, right. we don't know. Things can change on a dime. Um, as you said, someone could break out. You know, they could acquire someone in the draft who – turns out is way better than we thought you know guy you can find like hidden gems guys like you know ben taylor whatever in the eighth round you sign for 10k or pitching in the big leagues a year later you know you never know so uh well i mean look at last year like, look at last year's draft i mean the, the and on prospect rankings the top like six or seven guys from that draft are guys who were drafted early but then you look at like the next guy up on a lot of them who's starting to break into top 100 picks is nate pearson and where the heck did he go he went like 28th or something. 28th? Yeah, I mean, yeah. he was there when the Red Sox picked. So like, That's like, uh, there's another guy, uh, Calvin Mitchell, I want to say. he just okay. I was just looking at BA did a new top 100 today, mm-hmm. and uh, he was in the back end, and he was drafted in the second round last year by the Pirates. He's yeah. a high school outfielder from California, and now he's go. a top 100 prospect. So, yeah, with I good, mean, and even look at, the, look at the Red Sox system. Cutter Crawford got 125K and he's knocking on the door of the top 20 because he's actually has a couple of good pitches and he can throw strikes and he's shoving in Greenville. Yeah, although he should be in Salem, but we can talk oh, about I've, that when we get yeah, there. Yeah, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, with the rankings. Yeah. But yeah, so, I mean, I think that kind of transitions well into the, the draft is coming and it's kind of exciting because, mm-hmm. you know, as you said, the system is a little down right now, but it's a chance for some new blood. And the draft coming also means that Lowell's right around the corner, which is, you know, more guys that we haven't seen yet starting the season. So it could be, uh, hopefully, you know, it's uh, ebbs, and, uh, ebbs and valleys, as they say, and hopefully we're about to get a rise. And, uh, that, that was a fan, fantastic mixed metaphor in there. I know. Oh, I, just, I just blew that one badly. It's okay. Don't worry about it. We'll, leave. It's, we'll, we'll roll with it. We'll do a live. Um, okay. Well, speaking That's of the draft, like you said, I like thing. I like the transition. You should be hosting. Um, you know, so the other day I was on the conference call with, with Mike Rickard, the Red Sox um, vice president of amateur scouting, and uh, didn't really have a whole lot of, you know, in-depth things to say, of course, because at this point teams are, A, playing their cards close to the chest, uh, keeping their cards close to the chest. I can't really give you crap if I'm going to mess up, too. Um, And and frankly, as he said on the call, picking in the back half of the first round, there's a lot of uncertainty. You just, you really don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where guys are going to go. And In particular, the one interesting thing that he did say about this year's draft is that there's even more uncertainty in the top half of the draft than there typically is. So it's just really hard for them to know what's going to happen. He said that the team's hope was that by Sunday and maybe Monday morning, things would sort of start falling into place. But right now, they, you know, the draft could really go in so many different directions ahead of them you don't know what's going to be there at 26 where they make their first pick. Um, you know, before I kind of throw it to you, Ian, I think you're a little more up on things than I am right now with, with draft preview type stuff. Um, make sure you check out Mike Andrews draft preview on the news page. Um, <laughs> as the cat I'm comes Firefly. in. Yeah. Firefly the cat wants you to go look at the draft preview as well. You should though. It's really well. Mike does a ton of research for it. Does a great it. job. <laughs> he kind of always comes out of nowhere with it. And then yeah. I read it. And I was like, whoa, okay. He, he really lays out like guys for their first three picks and then later round options based on, you know, kind of the archetype that the Red Sox tend to focus on in the draft, which we've talked about before, mm-hmm. um, I- including my favorite pick he suggested in the later rounds. Um, your cousin, Chris Chatfield. Um, <laughs> I, I have to admit, so. uh, I, I pushed for his addition. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's just really in depth and it gives you a, a, a good, it give you kind of a generic idea with a bunch of different names to keep an eye on in the draft who have been linked at some point with the Red Sox. And he also so, does yeah. a great job of tooting our own horn for about four paragraphs about how yeah. Our, our hits and pass he's actually, we're actually he does a good job yeah he does a he's real actually good pretty job. good at it <laughs> um so, yeah. whether by hook or by crook um but yeah i mean you know, I, I guess you know what what's kind of the scuttlebutt on on who's being um who's being mocked to the red Sox right now and what 
do, if any of them, what do any of them have to do with what I am currently consuming uh, as we speak? Well, I would say that uh, the first thing is, interestingly enough, well, actually, let me preface this with saying none of this is my own personal information. This is all right. just gleaned from reading things like Perfect Game, Baseball America, ESPN, Fan Graphs, et cetera, their latest mock drafts. You know, mm-hmm. I, 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 I hear some stuff about the draft, but never in-depth stuff like this. So this is all just based upon kind of what they're t- aggregating their information. But it seems like the, gen- the general consensus is the Red Sox would like to draft a college player. And of late, the sexy name being linked to them is Seth Beer, who – you might remember because he had an insane freshman year and um, people, he was kind of like the big name. I want to say two years ago after team USA. And that's one of the things the Red Sox really like. It seems as team USA guys, but um, he's interesting to me because he would be such an un Red Sox pick. Cause he's just a corner. He's like a bad defender hitter. Like he just hits. That's about it. And it's, you know, if you can hit, I mean, you make it work defensively, and um, he would be very interesting just because we, we've talked at length about the lack of corner bats and lack of power in the system, and he kind of would fit both those molds as he's probably a first baseman. So uh, he was been linked. He was in a couple of the mock drafts I was looking at today, and then another one also had a, actually did have a high school player, but it was also a high school first baseman um who i don't think mike mentioned in his preview but who was who who was supposed to who was in a lot of the other mocks is going higher than the red sox pick but the, the fan graphs mock mock had him falling down to the red sox so i i personally would like to see them go after a bat um Same. i just think i just think at the end of the first round the the, the, the pitching options you're going to get i i don't I, I just don't think there's a lot of upside with the guys you're looking at there and i think that's the kind of like Pitching, pitching is such a crapshoot as we've seen with guys like Jay Groom. Like the Jay Groom pick, we talked about how lucky they got that he fell to them, and look where we are two years later. He's not even pitching, and he's going to be, you know, right. probably in twenty twenty have thrown fifty innings in his major league career in three years. Right. So it's just like pitching. I, I just is such a crapshoot. Whereas hitters, I mean, obviously you never know, but hitters. They're a lot easier to see. You kind of know what you're getting at least to start, and the question is well, how will they adjust to wooden bats, but if you're taking like a high college hitter, obviously that's something the Red Sox haven't had a lot of success with early in the drafts, I would say. But in terms of being able to f- what the system needs and what it could do, that's definitely something they could really use as someone who projects as like a major league quality bat. Because as we've talked about a lot, the top 10, top 20, there's a lot of guys who project or fringy, you know, borderline back end start relief types. There's not a lot of like everyday potential bats. Um, in our rankings right now, I mean, you have Shavis at number one, and then after that, you have to drop down the next hitter in the top ten is at number eight, and it's C.J. Chatham. And even the guys, the next eight through ten are all bats, but none of them I would project as everyday guys at this point. So they just have a real lack of depth at that, just hitting in general. So I, I, in terms of obviously you're, you're going to draft best, best player available, and that's what they should do. But if that turns out to be a college bat, which is what a lot of the mock drafts have fallen to them, that would be very interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I guess the counterpoint to that is they sure need arms too. I mean, it's not like they, they have need everything. I mean, really, yeah. like, right? Just that's that's kind of the deal. point. Um, yeah, but I think it's it's the risk assessment, and that I, I like what you're saying in terms of like get maybe the safer first rounder in a college bat if there's an exactly. appropriate one available, and use the fourth round pick, the third round pick, the fifth round pick on like the arm that falls, right? Get the, the Alex Scherf type, get the, the Mike Schwarren type that, you know, maybe isn't a first round talent. And, and it, it's not like you're getting the same player. Don't get me wrong no. here. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, I think the value proposition is to get the pitchers then, because the thing is, if they then need Tommy John and they're out for a year and a half, it's not your first round pick that's out for a year and a half. Exactly. And I also think that if you just look in general, when prospects come out of nowhere, it's a lot more often you see it with pitchers than you do with hitters, I feel like. You know, you look at like this year, for example, a lot of the one of the pop up guys, like a guy like Shane Bieber, he was on no prospect list coming in a year. And I believe he was like a fourth round pick out of Cal State Fullerton or something or UC Santa Barbara. He's a fourth round pick college guy. And now he's pitching in the big leagues, you know. A year, two years later and is a top 100 prospect mm-hmm. kind of out of nowhere like you don't see that as much with hitters and 
because I think it's I, I, it's it's tough to nail down exactly why that is, but I I, I think it's with pitchers, it's things can change a lot more quick or a lot a lot quicker in the sense that you know a guy might develop a new pitch, guy might tweak his mechanics, and all of a sudden he finds more velo or he finds command. Or with hitters, it's a lot. There's a lot. It's a lot harder to find that you know significant change, you know, because. You do see it on time and time on occasion with guys like you know JD Martinez is a good example. We see, we see what he's doing with the Red Sox right now, and he was a DFA'd you know by the Astros, and, and he changed his swing. and Look what he's one of the best hitters in baseball now. That doesn't happen very often. It happens more with pitchers finding some you know niche or some little change, the tweak that helps them out. So I think that you know if you can get some bats early, especially if they're the best player available. And then kind of just go volume pitching wise and hope to hit on one or two of those guys. That might not be the worst strategy, especially given the current state of the system. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. And, and you know, I, I'm intrigued to see how they go. You know, I kind of fear we'll get some like boring college reliever or something. But uh, you probably. Know, I, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I mean, we will we'll have to wait and see what what we get. Um, hopefully. Hopefully it's something we can get excited about, uh, you know, because the question will get asked and we've been asked it elsewhere. Um, where do you think the range is that the first round pick is going to wind up in the rankings? I would say probably two to five. Two to five sounds about right to me, too. Yeah. I mean, it depends who they are and frankly how we're feeling in the given time because it's just it's tough to compare, uh, you know, the pre-draft scouting report. Exactly. It's tough without getting eyes on a guy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So. All right, cool. Well, that's the draft. We'll, uh, you know, we're going to tr- – we'll at least have um, reporting on whoever they pick on the news page. That's news.socksprospects.com. We'll, prob- we'll have something up on there uh, the night of the draft as the picks get made. Uh, yes. And as the draft goes on, actually, so on day two, we'll have posts on – I think for the first ten rounds. For the first ten rounds, we have posts go up contemporaneously as the picks get made with information on guys. So make sure you check it out. out. Um, we are going to try and do a um, night of Are-G- reaction. Wait, yeah. Um, just a quick reaction post uh, uh, podcast to the first three picks. Um, well, no, only the first, the first two. First there, right? Yeah. No. Or the first two? It's just one, right? Oh, they changed it, didn't they? It's no, it's first the first round. two. No, it's the first two drink fruit two rounds are on day oh, one. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah, yeah, that then. Yes. Yeah, so it's the first two rounds. We'll have a uh, reaction to those, and uh, yeah, we're gonna try to do that. It'll be quick. No, no, no. no. It's first forty three picks are on the first day, so it's just the first pick. No, where'd you get that? I, I'm on Wikipedia right now. Well, that must be true. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it 2018 is. MLB draft. Enter. Uh, uh, all right, you just. Oh, no, you're, you said whatever you said. Oh, crap. Wikipedia was wrong. Damn it. You win. Wikipedia lied to me. You win. Well, you, you know what you could have read? What? Mike Andrews. Sox, Sox, Sox draft. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, Wikipedia it's, it's round it. one through the round two comp uh, competitive balance picks. I'm about to. I know a good lawyer who's going to take Wikipedia court for this false statement to me, making me sound dumb. That's funny. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I know. <laughs> awesome. If we have any kids listening to this, don't ever cite Wikipedia in a research paper. Yeah, don't do it. Just, don't do it. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on. Um, we'll kind of go through really quick, Ian, because uh, we're about we're about halfway through the show, so we we probably get. I mean, there's not <laughs> honestly, there's not a lot to talk about. Yeah, that. that's true. Um, <laughs> So the rank, we'll we'll talk about news in the context of the rankings. So uh, you know we we released new rankings today, or I guess yesterday. Technically, Mike put them up. Mm-hmm. Um, they went up on sometime mid afternoon. Anyway, a lot of changes. Um, I know I kind of went into doing my rankings, Ian. I don't know about you, with just slash and burn on my mind. Um, I did very little. Very little deference to my past rankings just because I'm so I was sort of fed up with things and just going by gut on a lot of stuff. Uh, new number one is Michael Chavis, even though he hasn't played this year because he's suspended for testing positive for a banned substance, um, which kind of says all you need to know. Uh, the old yeah, number one, there's not a lot to say, and it says everything, not a lot, said yeah. at the same time. 
um, the former number one, Jay Groom, fell to number four. And I think just in terms of rankings, Ian, I think the range we were considering him for was kind of like three to five. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever considered dropping him below Mike Schwarin at six. I did not. Um, I think at one point, in one draft, we had Groom at five and rethought it. Um, it, it's just tough, like you said. He's so he needs to. He got Tommy John surgery. Not needs. He he He's underwent at it. Underwent Tommy John surgery, and not going to pitch again until hopefully late next season. I mean, for a guy, say, the problem is that he also next year. Yeah, that sounds about right. Unless That's he gets in GCL games. Unless he gets in GCL games. But that would not be until like August. Right. It would be in August and it would be like one inning stints. Yeah. Um, the thing, well, because if you think about it, that would make sense because they've drafted guys and had them get into GCL games the fall, late the following season. Mm-hmm. Um, like Josh it's Pennington like, yeah, is the one I'm months, thinking of. 16 months. Yeah. The August problem with 14, Groom, 15. Yeah. the problem is that he already had a lost year because of injury last year. Yeah. As you mentioned, it's entirely possible he enters the 2020 season with like 60 professional innings in three years. No, uh, 2019, right? No, right. 2020. 2019. Right. No, no, no. Oh, 2019. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, entering 2020. This is 2018. Yeah, you're right. 20, yeah, he won't pitch right. next year. Enters 2020. I, I, I was looking at his player mm-hmm. page and he had no 2018 stats, so I was like, oh, it. Because he hasn't played yet. But of course, it's because, yeah. So, yeah, it'd be 2020. It is 20. Jesus. Yeah. Um, not great. He's the, the name that's coming to mind for him with me, Ian, and is not quite the same I know, is Hunter Harvey. It's a fair point. It's a good comparison. Um, of just a guy's development that, being completely derailed by injuries. Yeah. Because I, I, he, he had to be added to the 40 man roster this year, and he'd thrown like 25 innings in his career or something. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's not good. Um, no. I mean, he's going to have to be added to the Rule 5. Or not. He's Rule 5 eligible and would, in theory, have to be protected entering the 20, uh, the offseason after the 2020 20. season. Yeah, so he's got a while. He'll be back on the mound before then. He'll be back on the mound, but the thing is, there's a distinct possibility he'll have never pitched in Portland and need to be protected. Or at least Mm -hmm. in theory need to be protected, which it then raises an interesting question of like, do you protect him knowing he needs two full seasons in the minors? And he's going to like be entering what might be his debut season with one option left. I mean, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of, I feel like that's a. It's suboptimal. I mean, look what it did to Drake Britton. But you want to talk about lefty high school picks who needed Tommy John. I feel like you kind of hope that that's an option because if that's something you're debating, then that means he at least made it back. That's true. And that's got to be the first focus is getting him back on the mound and healthy. Because as we saw in spring training this year, the talent is immense mm-hmm. when he's out there. Right. The problem he's, is he's just barely thrown. Right. You know, he's, it's been something here, something there, and then boom, now he's done for two years basically. Yeah. And that's just kind of been the story of his career, it seems like, thus far. Pretty much. Um, and move, and yeah. the thing is, though, that's that was one of the concerns. Like, it's a high maintenance body, mm-hmm. and I don't. Obviously, you can't necessarily you can't pinpoint that as one of the. It's like him guys being who are six, six, two hundred. Yeah, him guys being are, six yeah. six two sixty with kind of a soft body, not necessarily you know as a precursor to injuries. But I, I can't. I'm you know you don't know if it helped or if it hurt. Like he's just been. It was a concern coming in. He obviously had, I think he had some sort of injury in high school, I want to say. Oh, no, he just missed. He was, oh, no, it was the eligibility The transfer thing. stuff, yeah. Yeah. But then, I mean, since his came to the pros, he's just, it's something here, something there, and yeah, so. Yeah. Um, moving on, uh, I wasn't really going to go into deep in this, but then when we were talking before we started the podcast, we had started having kind of an interesting discussion. Um, the number two and three prospects actually flipped spots, kind of. Uh, Tanner Houck jumped over Brian Mata to become the new number two prospect. Um, honestly, if I re-ranked my guys today, I would probably flip them. Um, I was just really da- disappointed in Mata at the time we ranked. Because um, keep in mind, when we released the new rankings on June 1, we started the process on, like, May 
twenty second. It's like end middle end of May, yeah. Yeah. So you know, Hauk's last two starts haven't been great, and Mata's have been good. Uh, Mata just you know the, I, it didn't help that when they were in Potomac, I didn't see his start, but he went an inning and two thirds, and I was talking to a scout who doesn't cover their system and just asked me, you know, what's the rush? With Mata, meaning like, why is he in Salem? He's in 19, he's nineteen, and he didn't look like he belonged. Um, without the context of, well, he threw pretty well in Greenville last year, but I, I don't know. I mean, the two of them I, for me, Ian, and I think you had a different take at first. For me, it's Houck's got a higher floor in my opinion because I have a hard time not seeing him pitching in the majors at least as a reliever. Whereas Mata, I could see not making it. Um, mm. I, I wouldn't say it's a lock. He pitches. I mean, you can see it. I didn't say it was a lock. In the bullpen is what I would say is mm-hmm. a better way to phrase it. That you could see how stuff playing in a major league bullpen role. Whereas Mata's, he's not a starter. It's a very fringy profile in relief. Yeah. And that's, I mean, how in the bullpen, I think could be in the majors next year. If they just go give up on the arsenal tweak just love their just fastball slider and throw like sinker five. slider, sinker yeah. slider for an inning at a time. From I think he's a slot for sure. I think he's ready opening day next year. If they did that, they're not but doing that because that they want to try it. First round pick. You can't do that with your first no, round pick. I'm not saying they should either. I'm just saying that's kind of why I think the floor is higher. Ceiling wise, I don't know. I mean, it's tough when you've got a guy whose arsenal you're completely tweaking, and we've already talked in depth about it on, on the last episode. But it's, it's just, just it's interesting to me. It's a yeah, coin flip. It, it, it's a it's a debate for sure. And another factor you got it like Hauk is two years older than Mata. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're at the yeah. same level. Yeah. You know, Mata. I would say Mata's overall arsenal is better than Hauk's, but Hauk has the better individual pitches. If that makes sense. Um, he's got the better best pitch you mean yeah like when his no even i would say even like when how his best on, two pitches yeah I when how on like he will show like two plus to better pitches mm-hmm. but he just doesn't all show that he rarely does and the command is not good i versus, have yeah no go ahead versus Mata is like a bunch of you know solid average above average you know a bunch of 50s and 55s Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not sure there's a plus pitch. He'll he'll flash like occasionally a a plus um, uh, change up, but it's like it's inconsistent, and he's still as what you'd expect as a 19 year old. So you know, it's just yeah, it, they're they're it's a really it's an interesting comparison. It's also a tough one because they are very different cases. Right, right, yeah. I mean, with Mata, you know, it's I'm I'm trying to find. I took some notes based on what the scout said in Potomac because he saw Mata. I mean, he had on the fastball velo, present four, future six, command, present three, future four, movement. So he saw a really bad command day. Yeah, he saw a really – I mean, he saw saw one of the um, inning and two-thirds starts. Okay, that Um, makes sense. Fastball movement, present five, future five and a half. Yeah. Uh, And the change-up was present – four i think future five yeah that's right i mean yeah it's a bunch of like 50s 55s at best yeah but it's like he's kind of like a sum of all parts guy versus hauk is the one who you know when he's on he'll show you the the power fastball or sinker slider combo right but now they're tweaking that they're going more with the curveball so it's kind of a work in progress for both of them i think this year and that's what you know we talked about it a little bit you mike and i did off that mata probably should have started in greenville but yeah, an 18, as an eighteen-year-old to start the year, well, it, it's, granted he had success, but it was seventy-seven innings. Well, but the th- I think the thing is, is it depended on how he looked in spring training. And he was again, good in spring training, from what we heard. From and, what we heard, he was good in spring training. I get it if he was good in spring training. Um, yeah, Hauk, to to Salem. Hauk, based on the start I saw in spring training, I was surprised they sent him to Salem. See, but I, I would say my counter to that is if you're a college guy who's a first round pick, you got to start at Salem. I disagree. I mean, I know it's like, I don't know. I just think it's it's a disappointing outcome both for the the you know the player and the staff if you have to send a first round pick who's a college guy to Greenville. I don't know. I don't. I, don't, I right think if you looked at the pick. actual first rounders from this past year, which I won't waste time doing right now. Because that's pretty in depth, but yeah, 
I don't think all of the college guys, even the guys picked ahead of him, all went to high A. But that's just I'll me. I'll tell you in two seconds how many did. I know one's already a double A. Right, but that's what I mean. I'm just saying, like, like what's the difference if you start him in Greenville for four, four or five starts? That's how does not- that slow his development down? I mean, I guess, okay, fair. For that long, it doesn't really. Yeah, that's but. what I'm saying. Just go, let him go there and say, look, you've got two new pitches you're throwing. We want you to go to Greenville and throw them. You know, don't blow guys away with ninth straight 96. Although I guess that's one of the pitches they want him to throw. So maybe blow guys away with straight 96. But, like, you know, maybe put the slider away for the most part. Work on the curve. Work on the change up. So, like, 10 of the guys selected ahead of him and most of the college guys, almost every college guy selected ahead of him is in high A or higher right now, except for Jake Berger, who hasn't played, obviously. Right, because he's been hurt. Um, And McKay got promoted, so he didn't technically start there. Well, that's what I'm saying is do the McKay thing. Like All the other guys have started in high A. Oh, no, actually, J.B. Bukoskis didn't. Right. So most of them did. Yeah. So it's like a couple. So you probably could have I mean, done that. Most but. of the college guys that got drafted in the first round aren't having their entire arsenals tweaked. That's that is that's what makes the case unique. I that's agree. my point. Fair. Uh, all let's, right. Should, let's move on. Number five prospect is Jalen Beeks, who is kind of he's taking the country by storm, Ian, or, or at least the bucket hanging out everyone <laughs> yeah I, where the heck did this come from you saw him make his worst start of the year of course of course um what, what, what is the deal like we actually haven't even really talked too much about this so i'm interested in hearing what you have to say not that i'm not usually interested in what you have to say uh, he's thrown a ton of cutters that's mm. the big change um coming into the year he was more of a fastball change up slider guy um, and he would show like an occasional, he'd show a throw curveball, but the curveball has always been like a kind of a show me steal a strike pitch, mm-hmm. but well, he, he, had, he had actually scrapped the slider entering last year just to, yeah, no, no. Back. Yes. I, I was going to get there, but he didn't throw the cutter that much last year. And now he's just throwing it a ton mm-hmm. and, um, it's, it's a good pitch. It's his best pitch by far. Um, and I, I definitely, it's, it's an intriguing th- pitch because he uses it to both righties and lefties it's pretty good velo he throws it uh like 87 to 89 so it's a, it's a little little it's got some separation from his fastball but it just he gets a lot of swing and misses with it um and you know i saw him and he had two four six eight ten twelve he had 14 swing and misses in a game where i didn't think he was very good frankly yeah well i mean that's a lot <laughs> and still he had 14 swing and misses and eight strikeouts in six innings there you go and so you know, he's got this pitch now that he can rely on in any count, and he just throws it a lot, and hitters are having a lot of trouble hitting it. The problem was, if the command is off, it's still a pretty fringy profile, and as a result, his home he's given up a lot of home runs. Um, he's up to seven home runs this year, um, whereas a point of reference, he gave up 13 all of last year. Hmm. So his home run rate is up. It's doubled, basically. It was uh, like 8% last year. No, not almost doubled. It was it was about, if you average Pawtucket in Portland, it was about 8.5 last year. It's up to f- almost 14 this year. But at the same time, his strikeout rate has jumped from like 26% to 35%. Yeah. I mean, so he's, he's kind of changed. It seems like he's kind of selling out for, you know, get a bunch of strikeouts but also occasionally you're going to miss make them you're going to make a mistake pitch and it's going to get hit right and i think the the cutter is interesting because it gives him a pitch that he can kind of just like rely on and just throw it over and over again and when his curveball which the part of the problem was in this outing his curveball was not on he could barely throw it for a strike and it was just it, he was he probably threw like six or seven the entire game so more or less he was a two-pitch guy just throwing fastballs and cutters and that's that's tough to get by with that. But if you have a cutter working, we've seen guys do that before. Mm-hmm. So I, I think now what what's changed for me is I give him a slightly better chance to start than I did in the past because he does have a pitch that I, he does. I would say the cutter cutter would is borderline plus. I probably wouldn't call it a plus pitch, but it, it's it's an above average pitch. I would say flash like a, plus. Yeah, occasionally. 
Okay. I wouldn't. I, I don't think I. It prob. But the problem with saying Flash Plus is then people hear that and think Plus. Yeah. No. I. I wouldn't call it that. But yeah. so he does. He didn't have a pitch like that before, really. Mm-hmm. And so now he does. And so that's definitely a thing. And so I would say, you know, there's a chance to be like a number four type starter there. But I still think it's like a 50-50 shot. He's a swingman reliever, which I actually really do. I still maintain that that could be a very good role for him. And we've kind of seen it. Some teams are embracing that and turning into something more like I really – what the Rays are doing, which right, with, right. They, with, their, with their guys like Ryan Yarbrough, who, you know, he's a lefty with kind of fringy stuff. And they basically just make it so he skips the first part of the order mm-hmm. the first time through and then only has to throw to them once or twice in the game. And still gives them five, six innings of work. That's very interesting, and something that I think could be. Obviously, I don't. I'm not sure the Red Sox want to go down that route, but Beaks could be useful in like a three, four inning bridge role um, as soon as this year. And just his ability to miss bats, though, also gives me hope that if they did decide to go full time bullpen, I think he could be pretty good in that role of just you know go out there, let it fly, throw fastballs and cutters, and just strike guys out. If you're gonna sit Drew Pomerantz down for two weeks to figure things out are you calling Jalen Beeks up to start or are you going with uh Velasquez or probably Stephen Pat. Wright it's probably Stephen Pro- Wright probably Stephen Wright gets it but yeah I mean I, I think I don't think Beeks is far off I definitely think we see him at some point this year and oh, yeah. at worst like his platoon splits he destroys lefties now mm-hmm. oh, I don't know really? if you've looked at his splits Against lefties, so, for, yeah okay you, nine, you've nine, got it up. I've got it already 19.2 innings 12 hits 29 strikeouts, two walks, two earned runs. It's 29 strikeouts and 69 batters face. Yeah. So that's like pretty, his, strike, that's nice. his strikeout rate is 42. Very nice. His strikeout rate is 42% <laughs> against lefties. That's like, crazy. That's kind of crazy. Like, that is like, he could be a weapon. As Let's a put it this way. It's a 185 batting average against on a 334. Sorry, sorry, 314 average on balls in play. Yeah. So like, he's, he's getting, getting, relative, so he's getting a little bit unlucky. Like he, they lefties, and this was I noticed this too in the game. Like, except for Dylan, Dylan Cousins murdered a ball off him. I should say, but uh, Dylan Cousins is also like Dylan six Cousins. Foot. Yeah, Dylan Cousins is a monster. Yeah, but um, but like he, he lefties had a lot of trouble because the cutter just he just he can bury it in on the hands of them, you know, kind of like back door where it starts off the plate and then comes on the inside corner. Or I guess front door it actually, and then he also can just bury it down in a way where it starts. It looks like a strike and just falls off away from them. And you look against righties, he's been solid against righties, but six home runs, 29 hits, like mm. righties are getting to him a little bit. He's still striking a ton of guys out, but it's just the platoon split thing has me really intrigued. And I, I do think he's going to contribute at some point this year to the Red Sox, um, especially yeah. when you look actually, funnily enough, his platoon splits last year in Pawtucket he, against lefties, 25 innings. So a few more innings, 31 hits. Well, you can't really play. use innings with... Splits. Yeah, that's true. That's not a great. I guess batters faced. Yeah, use batters that? faced in a hundred and four guys faced. Ten eight seven hit nine. Um, K nine was just about nine home runs per nine was over one was almost one point five. You know three forty two OBP four ninety slugging versus this year two oh six OBP two ninety two slugging. So this cutter has made a big difference for him against lefties, and it's definitely yeah. something that uh, he can rely on against them. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we'll, we'll have a write up. I'm going to write him up at some point. What do you think draft. about Beeks Velo playing up out of the bullpen? Seems like a possibility think, for him. Yeah, he was. He was. Oh, I should mention he was 90 to 92 when I saw him with his four seam. But I've seen him up to 95 in the past, and I think that you could tell he was just when he's throwing all pace the cutters, him. he kind of just paced himself with the Velo, and he's working deeper into games, which I like too. Like he threw, I want to say eight innings last night. Hmm. Um, all right. Seven innings. Seven innings last night. He's gone seven, six, 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 five, six point two, five point two six in his last like eight starts. There you go. So he's throwing deep in the games, and with his the changes he's made to his delivery over the year, which we've kind of chronicled in on the site. He's definitely he's he's a guy kind of like what we talked about earlier. Guys who can come out of nowhere, twelfth round pick out of Arkansas, right. who's developed into a legitimate potential big league pitcher. So uh, yeah, like he's it. yeah. I like it. Um, looking elsewhere in the rankings, I guess we should probably at least briefly mention CJ Chatham jumping up to eight. Um, finally starting to play the field again about a week ago for Salem uh, after not playing the field for about a month and a half, DH only, um, plus a short DL stint. 
uh, good to see him there, and it, it kind of plays into the fact that probably one of the biggest risers in this month's rankings is Santiago Espinal. He's the new number 15 prospect infielder for Salem, who was the shortstop from the start for Salem from the start of the year until about a, a week, week ago. ago. And now that Chatham is playing shortstop, Espinal is rotating between short second and third he's starting to get time at other infield positions which i i think is intriguing definitely I, it's a utility profile for me always mm-hmm. has been but he's athletic he can play defense he has he can hit a little bit and he's finally showing some pop this year so yeah he's he's super aggressive on the base pass he's about a 60 runner um he actually when i saw him in potomac uh, in the first game I saw him, he stole third base because he got caught off of second base on a pickoff. Oh, love that. <laughs> uh, so he gets credit for the steal, even though he basically got caught leaning. Um, it was a bad play, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he uh, let's see, he, he legged out a single uh, on a ball hit to shortstop. Uh, he got caught stretch. Oh, actually, he, yeah. See, the problem is I wrote this in pen and I wrote pencil and I wrote on pen behind it. Ooh, um, <laughs> rookie mistake. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, oh, no, 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 no. You know what happened? He got caught stretching. Oh, he got caught stretching a, uh, a, a, a double into a triple. Double into a triple later on. Um, and then, let's see. Oh, and then the next day he got, uh, no, who am I? Okay. Oh, no, you know what it is? I got caught stretching and I read it as caught stealing. Gotcha. But he is aggressive. I stand by the point. Uh, very aggressive, very athletic, very loose up there. Um, uses a lead leg, leg lift. A lot of pre-pitch mush movement, which is mm-hmm. interesting. Um, but definitely hitting for a lot more power this season, which is kind of the big change. He's slugging 491, uh, and he already has six home runs this year after hitting four last year in Greenville and slugging 358 on the yeah, season. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm just looking at the advanced stats right now, and he, he's always been a good K walk guy. You know, mm-hmm. he's never struck out more than uh, yeah, this year's highest, the same. but it's 12.7%. It's the same thing. Yeah. And it's, BABIP is not outrageous. It's 318. Nope. You know, that's pretty normal. His walk rate is staying the same as last year. The big change in his batted ball profile is the ground ball rate. Ground ball rates dropped from 46% to 32%. Mm-hmm. That's a significant change. And the thing I like is that he's it's, not doing it. It's not for fly balls. It's for line drives. Yeah, so he's just he's, more hard contact. Yeah, when I saw him, he was hitting everything hard. I mean, I have, you know, first inning, else line out to shortstop. Second inning, ripped single down the left field, down the left side. Fourth inning, ripped double to left center. Stole third base when he got caught off of uh, second base. Sixth inning, had that infield single. Um, eighth inning, you know, he grounded out. But next day, uh, second inning, long F9. Uh, fourth, line out to center. Yeah. Seventh, 6-3, well struck. I mean, everything exactly. is hit on the screws, and that's what you like and to see. And that's the point is that you, you like – you like to see that change in bat a ball profile, but he's not giving up contact at the same no. time, if that makes sense. No. And that's a really good sign. So he's someone who's definitely, I think, very interesting in terms of the lower tier of the system. Yeah, and he looked fine fielding the position. I mean, I didn't see him make enough plays to call him above average or anything like that. I mean, he definitely made all the plays that were to him. When I saw him in instructs and spring training, I, I would have called him probably like an above average defender at short. Okay. Yeah, I don't that think, sounds right. That squares with... He's not going to win a gold glove there, but he could stick at the position. But yeah. at the end of the day, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure the bat's there to carry a starting projection. So he'll probably, as they are kind of already using him, um, I think his value is going to come from defensive versatility. Right. I, I, I'll make a bold prediction slash hot take right now. I bet Santiago Espinal is a top 10 prospect in the system by the end of the year. I mean, I, yeah, I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah, I mean, he the needs to thing, do more, and one, I will see him again. Is he's 23 already. Yes, exactly. So he is on the old side. So if I'm them, I get him up to Portland sooner rather than later. Yeah, especially with Jeremy Rivera just not having a good year up there. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess that they can play Chad De La Guerra a little bit more at short, but uh, now that he's been demoted from Pawtucket. But, um, you know, if you look at the Portland lineup, I mean, is let's see if it's been De La Guerra or Rivera. Yeah, it's been Rivera still like recently. Tony Renda, too, at the second base. Well, Renda's not playing short at all. Oh, he is? Okay. No, no oh, Renda's not. not playing short. He's actually exactly. playing. I mean, he just went on the DL for one thing. But oh, really? But actually, once De La Guerra went back down, they started playing Renda pretty much exclusively in left field and DH. Ah, uh, gotcha. Because I saw him play second. That's why I was mentioning it. Right. When I saw Portland, he was playing second. Yeah, the sec- second base has been Lavulo and De La Guerra. 
and short stops been mostly Rivera with a little bit of De La Guerra. So I'm wondering if they're getting getting away from De La Guerra at short a little bit. Yeah, he wasn't great there. So that yeah. wouldn't be surprising. I mean, he was okay. I think, yeah, briefly on Chatham too. It's just I think it's good to see him healthy. That's mm-hmm. the biggest thing. Yeah, he's a talent here. He's he's a talented kid. You know, he's got a good frame. He's hitting. He can play shortstop, and he can. I I think there's contact skills. I don't think there's power. But and as long and the key is just he needs to stay on the field. You know, he it's kind of similar in the groom vein. He's just had all these weird injuries. Like they find a broken hand in his during his physical after he signs. He then comes back and what does he strain his hamstring and then what? tears it later in the season mm-hmm. on a rehab assignment and just like stuff mm-hmm. like that. No, he tore it in his there. first game back. Yeah. So that's what I mean. Like he, he, he yeah. heard it and then he came back and then tore it and he was done for the year. And it's like, he's another guy who's missed so much developmental time. It's just good to see him on the field and excelling. Yeah. I think he actually heard it again while he was like about to start playing in rehab games or something. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so that's good to see. Um, moving down the list, guys, we should talk about – you had wanted to talk about Alex Scherf. I guess you can do that really briefly, and we're already uh, approaching time a little bit here. Yeah, no, it's just he's – It's I not, haven't seen him this year, and, and the reports earlier in the year were underwhelming. But just looking, he's kind of – seems to kind of maybe turn the corner a little bit. Um, his last couple of starts have been solid. Um, tonight and then tonight, uh, we're recording this on Friday. He threw six innings. I want to say like gave up a couple hits, no runs. And it made, I want to say three straight or four straight starts where he's given up less than, nope, sorry, five, five straight starts where he's given up less than five runs, uh, three runs. And this was his longest outing of his career. He won six innings, gave up five hits, one walk, three strikeouts. And it seems just the biggest change is he's cut down on the walks. Um, he was walking, you know, three six three guys in this first couple of starts and his last five have all been one one walk only so he's throwing more strikes strikeouts are still not there um mm-hmm. but you know and as we kind of talked about when Chaz and i uh we we saw him in spring training and then wrote him up in notes from the field at spring training it was going to be a work in progress you know it wasn't like uh he wasn't a guy who's going to move quickly he's not a guy who will be show you consistent stuff from game to game but in flashes he will and that's obviously they saw a lot of him to be willing to give him the bonus they did in the fifth round so it's good to see him having some success and i'm sure that's you know good for him too um obviously mentally it's tough going out there and getting hit every time so when you get on a run like this hopefully it's something you can carry on uh towards the second half one guy we should talk about is the number 12 prospect travis lakins has moved up in the rankings after coming back off of an injury he was really rehabbing uh, the uh elbow fracture uh, stress fracture, I think it was from last season, but he's back in games, and it's kind of interesting what they're doing with him. Ian, first off, I, 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 you haven't seen him, right? No, I have seen him. Oh, you have? Okay. Well, so when he came back, they started. They, he was starting pitcher, and he was doing three inning outings, which was very interesting. So he was going out, and I guess the the, the idea was three inning outings. He didn't yeah, get they, to three. He, he didn't he get to on, three innings every time. He was on. I want to say. It was like 60 pitches or something. 60-something pitches, yeah. Um, but yesterday, yeah, yeah so was... he was starting, and uh, he was actually being piggybacked by Teddy Stankiewicz. And it's yeah. actually kind of interesting. Um, we thought It looked like they, the word at the one point, as reported by, I think it was Alex Spear, um, was that they were trying to decide. First of all, the stuff looked great reportedly. He was having great success. I saw it. The stuff was very good. Yeah, and they were trying to determine whether to continue to start stretching him back out into starter outings to keep him in that kind of three-inning hybrid sort of role, which I was very intrigued by. Yeah, I'm a big advocate of that role. I'm sorry? I said I'm a, I'm a big fan of that role also. Role, we're seeing we got it. Yeah. guys have it a lot. There's a lot, several guys like the Josh Hader. Josh Hader, Sir Anthony Dominguez, guys like that pitching, you know, bring him in in a high leverage situation, let it throw two, three innings, however many pitches he's got. Right. Um, but Or the other option, which is what it looks like they've now gone with, was to convert him to the bullpen full time. Yesterday on May 31st, he, he had a one inning relief outing, his first of his career. And I think that the determination is just that, you know, I mean, it's not a big body. Just probably wasn't going to hold up the starting after consecutive years in which he, you know, his, his elbow basically gave out. Um, so it looks like they're moving him to the bullpen. Um, what are your thoughts on that movie? And I think it's, it's, it's where you had projected. And even I remember, um, 
uh, uh, Chaz writing him up in Lowell. And his report on the stuff was really great, but he said, look, it's probably still a reliever long term. And it looks like that that's the projection. Um, just seems like they're, as we've talked about, getting to the point rather than stringing him along when he's not going to be able to start in their projection, exactly. at least. Exactly. And with him, as you alluded to, it's the health. He's just, mm-hmm. he's had these injuries. And if, they think that in a one inning bullpen roll is the way to keep him healthy. Then I say go for it because the stuff is it's premium stuff. Um, he was up to 96, mostly 94, 96. When I saw him below tailed off, even in three innings of work though. So, you know, we were down in 92, 94 by the third inning. Well, that's, I mean, that's the telltale sign, right? So, yeah. But so like, you know, if you're coming out 94, 96 with a cutter and a curveball, and the, both of them were good pitches, then that's a really interesting profile out of the bullpen. And I wonder if he's another guy who could move really quickly if he succeeds in that one inning bullpen role and could potentially put himself in contention for a call up later in the year. Yeah, I, I mean, if you think about it, why not, right? He's in double A, and if he starts shoving, I mean, it's kind of almost like a Jamie Callahan type situation last year where, you know, if he starts having really, you know, again, if he's dominant, not if he's just pitching okay, because no. yeah, they've got it's, guys it's ahead of him. He, he forces the hand. Right, right. But, I mean, he's Rule 5 eligible this coming off season, so there's no problem with adding him to the 40-man now. And You're he, going to have he to. Would get, he would get picked if he wasn't. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no question. No so question. I, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan, and I think the reason he moved up for me was just I, I think the floor is there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of a mishmash from, like, after 10, I would say right now, maybe after nine. Um, right. Agreed. Even, even after seven, you could argue if you really wanted to, right. but you know, those guys are all there and some of them have higher ceilings, some of them higher floors. And Lakins is one of those guys that, you know, I'm, I'm bare barring health. I'm pretty confident saying he'll be a big leaguer and it could be in relatively short order. And in this system, given how thin it is, that's, you know, a top borderline top 10 guy. Right. Even if there's not a lot of upside. Right. Oh, um, moving down, Ian, I guess one guy that I just want to mention, uh, and then I, you know, I don't know whether we should talk. Well, let's start with, do you want to talk about Cole Brandon at all? We should at least talk, mention, uh, on May 18th, he was reassigned to extended spring training, AKA demoted to Lowell when the Lowell season starts. Um, the, not, the line in Greenville is just not pretty. 157, 246, 205. Heavy, heavy ground ball rate. I mean, he, I'm pulling it up right now. He had a 69% nice. ground ball not rate. Really no, not nice, actually, as yeah. it turns out, in that context, at least. Uh, striking out in 30% of his plate appearances, which isn't terrible, uh, frankly. I mean, he's done that. But it's kind of interesting, too, for a guy who walked a ton last year and who we saw working a lot of walks. Um, in, in spring training, and who you know that seemed like to be a part of his profile. The walk rate was only nine percent, uh, so that wasn't even that high. Just clearly was overmatched. In, um, I, I, and I think that I wonder if that was the book was like pitchers realized that he was overmatched and were just like, all right, well, hit it. I think what it was was it was. I mean, I saw one game. Um, admittedly, as a fan, uh, it was uh, my my sister in law was nice enough to get married in Greenville. Uh, so I was, city. can't blame her for that. No, great city, great ceremony, uh, and I, I've loved visiting Greenville every time I've gotten down there. Um, the, the Red Sox really do have affiliates in a couple of in some nice cities. Like Greenville's uh, my favorite park in the minors. I've been to. It's gorgeous down yeah, there. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, it's a nice park. Um, great people. Yeah, great people. Uh, yeah, we love the folks there. It's always good to see the guys up in the press box. Uh, didn't get to see Eric, unfortunately, but. It happens. Um, but the thing is, like I said, I was there with family, and uh, it was dollar beer night, which was also a plus. Why not? So, hey, roll tide. Um, I've been listening to a lot of Bruce Pritchard, Pritchard lately. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, but Brandon just, it was just slapping the ball to the left side and trying to run it out. Uh, yeah, and I'll and just say, just like, not play. I, the reports I got were not good. Just rolling over on everything is what he was um, doing. Yeah. The, the reports weren't good. They kind of jived with what we saw in spring training and talked about on the podcast that will be released at some point. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, it's a work in progress with him. Mm-hmm. I, there's not a lot more you can say, you know, mm-hmm. he's going to have, it's going to take some work because it's, it's a weird profile um, given yeah his frame and his fragile, kind of a fragile frame. I'm, I'm not sure how much projection there is. And, you know, there's definitely he's got a few tools, but he's going to have to. There's a lot of work needs to be done, and, and 
yet they they kind of reached the point it seems like where they just couldn't it wasn't beneficial to throw him out there against the greenville pitching or the the low a pitching Mm -hmm. and hopefully he can go to lowell and kind of right the ship there yeah yeah for sure um one guy I want to mention really quick, Ian, is uh, Jake Thompson, who I saw pitch in Potomac recently. And, you know, it was actually – I liked what I saw, especially given that the last time I had seen him, which was only the first time I would seen him in person, was the look we got in spring training where he basically was not great in a simulated game. Um, not even a simulated game. It was just batter pitcher um, where f- three of the four innings he threw, the inning got rolled based on pitches. So – This outing, I actually really kind of liked what I saw and the potential there. The fastball was 90 to 93, topping out at 95. Um, He had better command of it than than what we had seen. He's still short arms. I don't love the delivery. It still looks like a a bullpen delivery to me, if I'm being honest. Yeah, he's a reliever for me. I mean, it's it's probably a reliever. But I did like the stuff. The splitter that he's added this year did look a lot better. Um, The the thing that was tough for me is the splitter and slider are about the same velocity band. So much Mm -hmm. they're both low 80s. And the viewing angle at Potomac is not great. Um, so it was tough. The pitches were kind of blending into one another, but they both, I mean, he got, uh, let's see, uh, swings and misses on the fastball, one on what I thought was a splitter for a swinging strikeout, another, uh, one was at 84, one was at 83, singing strikes on, I think, I thought they were splitters, but I kind of realized after the game that the splitter and slider were blending into each other for me at my viewing angles, but, uh, got swinging strikes on all three pitches. Uh, it, it was a nice outing. I really liked what I saw from him. Uh, the line didn't look great because he went back out for the sixth, gave up the double on the home run. Double to legit major leaguer Anthony Rendon, who was rehabbing. Oh yeah, That's a I great mean, lineup he's facing. Yeah, you know, it was Carter Rendon. Keyboom who went yeah. deep later in the game. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that was a tough again, look. That's, that's a good example, though, of A, don't look at minor league stat lines without context, and B, you know my theories, my, 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 uh, my, my hatred or my uh, problem I have with extra innings for guys when they should clearly be yeah. taken out of games. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I understood why they threw him back out for the sixth. I wasn't surprised yeah. that no, they did. No, no. It's just that he clearly ran out of gas against two very good hitters. And they was kind of like, all right, that's enough. You know, we gave well, you those two that's guys. A tough, that's a tough one on him. It's kind of like, hey, go back for your sixth inning of work. Oh, by the way, you're facing three big leaguers basically right, or right. potential big leaguers well two so, he yeah. only lasted for the two okay um, there you go <laughs> yeah. um anybody else in the top 20 you want to mention i think yeah, that's about I mean, it i mean the only other guy i could think of to really talk about is cutter crawford if we have much to say about him at 21 um he well actually i want to mention roll donnie baldwin too because i saw him but cutter crawford uh, he pitched the night that i went we were sitting on like the first base side and i was only really half paying attention uh, so I don't really have much of a scouting report for you, but I even, actually have a scouting report on oh, him. Oh, go for it. We'll, we'll, we'll do um, we'll do tail. Uh, I mean, everything that I've heard is that it's he should be in Salem. I also think he's probably a reliever, but and he should probably he's still probably a reliever. Yeah, but um, let me find it. Where is it? Well, in the it? meantime, let me talk about Rodani Baldwin. Baldwin, okay, I really liked. Ahead. I liked him at the plate. Honestly, um, the behind the dish. You know, there were some good things and some bad things. He looked like a high-A catcher, honestly, who was still finding his way. He's not a defensive whiz high-A catcher. He's a, you know, guy who's learning to play catcher, high-A catcher, where he had some really, you know, he's athletic. He can move a little bit. Um, I I remember a couple pitches getting by him that probably shouldn't have, but he wasn't a hack back there. I wasn't sitting back there, you know, thinking... You know, oh wow! You know he's Ryan Lavarnway, and there's no way he's a major league catcher. Um, Ryan Lavarnway is a major league catcher, though. Well, or was. I mean, you know what I mean. I, I, I'm just giving you a hard. Um, the arm was a little iffy. He's, you know, he's going to have to watch the body. It's a thick lower half. But at the plate, I mean, he stung balls, man. Um, he when he connects, he strokes it. Um, at the same time, connecting you know, he, is an issue. Yeah, connecting is an issue. I mean, his first at bat, uh, the first game I saw, he struck out on a breaking ball low that just completely fooled him. Um, but later in the game, he he hit a home run to center field where it's like four hundred to dead center. So yeah, uh, you know the power's there. He, he he looked pretty good, but breaking balls gave him trouble. Uh, also below average run. So, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's, yeah, I found the Crawford stuff. Okay, uh, so Crawford. 91-94, uh, fastballs on the straight side, slider 85-87, looks kind of like a cutter at times. Uh, that's his go-to secondary. 
fringy curveball 77 to 78 projects as a middle reliever due to lack of pure stuff and high stress delivery yeah that sounds about right yeah i was kind of surprised by the delivery it wasn't as kind of i guess i just kind of assumed for some reason that it would be cleaner um yeah. i do remember that but i'd from- say uh, the only other guy i would mention in that top 30 to close things out kind of because after that it's oh, option that, there is yeah um i saw both i guess we could lump butchery in there too i saw ty butchery and williams Harez in portland or P- portland in Pawtucket. Uh, recently and uh both showed premium stuff like big time especially harris it was the best i've seen him throw ever i would say mm-hmm. um he was oh let me find my notes sorry i was looking at the wrong game it was my favorite a double header so got a lot of <laughs> stuff out of play. yeah um but anyway and no extra innings either which was the biggest luck of the century i'm pretty go. sure whenever i see a double header there's always at least one extra innings game well now with the, now if they had double uh if they had extra innings you would have had a guy on second base in the eighth inning oh my favorite rule i love that rule i haven't had it this year yet but i'm a huge advocate of let's get the game over with because i don't want to see position players pitch i would just say call it after nine if it's supposed to be a seven in a game and call it after 12 it was supposed you to be a nine inning game. i don't hate it i don't hate it um but uh, Williams Jerez was – I saw him up to 99. He was like right. 96 to 99. That's new. With, yeah. With – I mean, it was like too fringy to average secondaries. But when you're throwing, when you're topping out at 99 from the left side, that's interesting. Well, let me try and, and find – I saw him in spring training. Keep going. And this was – the thing that – the big thing for me was he was throwing strikes this time. And, and that's literally what it comes down to with him is – because if you look at his game logs is – um, I'm just bringing it up now. He, uh, I saw him. He went two innings, five strikeouts, two point one, and excuse me, five strikeouts. He struck out five of the seven batters he faced. But then you know he comes back the next time, gives up a home run in his next start, and a couple runs. And it's with him, it's it's he either has good outings or he's get, giving up runs. Um, there's not a lot of in between. You know, kind of an average of shoutings. And yeah. he's got thir- 31 strikeouts in 23 innings this year, but he's also got 23 hits and 10 walks. So. The command is the question, but if he can harness that with his raw stuff, it's very interesting. And yeah. the same, it's the same story with Butchery. Butchery was 95, 96 with a slider, like 84 to 88, or excuse me, a changeup at 84 and then a slider at 88. And the secondary stuff is good when he throws strikes, but if you're not throwing strikes, and I mean, he's another guy who struck out everyone this year. He struck out... 35 guys in 22 innings but he's also allowed 21 hits four home runs and 10 walks and so it doesn't matter how hard you throw if your command isn't on even against triple a hitters it's not going to work and if it doesn't work against triple a hitters it's certainly not going to work against major league hitters yeah so if you know those two are pretty similar profile to me which is why i kind of like why we have them or we have them next to each other in the rankings where if they harness their raw ability they would be much higher on the list it's just the odds of them both now they're 25 and 26 respectively doing that you know lessons with each passing year but with relievers i wouldn't you don't rule those guys out because you relievers you've seen them be late bloomers you know guys not come and find their stuff until they're 26 27 28 years old so they're both interesting guys i would say still yeah uh harris for me in spring training i saw him, uh one inning three batters strikeout swing a 96 strikeout swing a 95 ground out on the slider so sounds like it kind of squares with what you saw when he's good yeah, and he's throwing a slider splitter now, which is weird because you don't see many left throw splitters. That makes sense. But, yeah. uh, it's pretty decent. It's like 88 to 89, the splitter. And then the slider was 87 to 90. I saw, yeah, yeah I saw the slider 86 to 88, and he threw what I, I, I put cutter, question mark, 88 and 90. It could so. have been the, either the splitter or the slider. So, yeah. yeah. So that could have been but, the splitter. Uh, I mean, it's a big arm for a lefty. Yeah. And another yeah. example of why you don't give up on guys who throw really hard or mm-hmm. who have big for outfielders because it's wild to think he was drafted in 2011 <laughs> it's wild to think he was drafted in 2011 three rounds before Mookie Betts oh my god you're right I didn't even think about that yeah, <laughs> yeah. that draft man I, I feel like I say this once every third podcast but I want to have like two months to write the oral history of the Red Sox 2011 draft you'd write like a novel out of that <laughs> I mean between the major leaguers the two guys who are now relief pitchers between him and Jordan Weems, who's in Portland. Were hitters. Yep. And were Jordan hitters. Weems, we can, if we want to, we I'm not going to go in depth, but interesting now. Uh, I saw him in spring training at 94 to 96, I just realized. I, I saw him the same thing in yeah. 
with uh, and he's had he got he had he was very good with Salem to start the year and they promoted him to Portland and with Portland he's had some trouble with uh, the walks and giving up a few hits but thirteen strikeouts in ten innings so yeah yeah um, yeah and then you've got fourth rounders no way Ramirez. Um, yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we, we, we discussed it kind of earlier. Um, yeah, yeah, and then guys who got to, yeah, we already talked about this. Anyway, <laughs> well, we're repeating ourselves, and... So which means it's probably time to wrap it up. <laughs> Fire, Firefly the cat is in here demanding belly pets, so I think I'm going to oblige her, and I think I'm going to free Ian, and I think I'm going to go to bed shortly thereafter because I'm an old person. Mm-hmm. Um, as always, we want to thank our podcast producer, Joe Tetralt. Uh, we want to thank all of you for listening. And of course, follow us on Twitter. The site's Twitter account is at Sox, uh, sorry, at Sox prospects. I am at SP Chris Hatfield and you can follow Ian at Ian Cundall. That's I A N C U N D A L L spelled just like it sounds. Uh, Ian, any parting shots for the people? Stay uh, positive. Make sure, yeah. Stay positive. Uh, stay with the site during the draft we're gonna have a ton of stuff Mm -hmm. donation drive uh yeah please uh check out if if you have uh if you're have some uh extra income or money that you're able to help us or even yeah even if you don't just you know if we we appreciate any help you can get any any donation is more than generous and uh just thank you all for your support and listening we should go all right thanks everybody for listening peace out